I want to talk to you this morning. Many of you were here last week, and we started in this new series, How to Hug a Vampire. And if you've been paying attention, you realize it has really nothing to do with a vampire at all. Uh, it has, we're not talking about vampires. We're not celebrating vampires. We're talking about how to love people who have hurt you and how to love people that continually take things from you and really drain you of your energy and of your joy and of your security and of your passion. And if you were here last week, you know that the first point was and the first step into in how to love, love those people is to realize that, you know, we, in, the first step in loving people who suck the life out of you is to realize that we suck too, is that we are that same person. At some time in our life, we have been that person that all we did was take that we weren't giving anything through our words and through our actions and through, uh, you know, through our personality and anything. We were just draining people. And so we talked about that last week about how we first got to receive salvation and we've got to get things right. And so today, the next point in this message and the kind of the next step in this that I want to deal with us today is, is forgiveness, is moving from bitterness to forgiveness. You and I have two options in every relationship that we have. We either choose forgiveness or we choose bitterness. And if you don't choose forgiveness, then you're choosing bitterness. Everybody say amen. That's in every relationship that we have. It's not just in our relationship with God. It's in every relationship that you have. I could line every married couple up this morning and I could say how many of you have had to forgive your lovely husband, and your lovely wife. And everybody would say, yes, I've had to forgive or I haven't forgiven. In every single relationship, we have that decision to make. Buck's getting nervous. So we have that decision to make forgiveness or bitterness. If you look in Luke chapter 22, we find here, and I want to read this first off. Luke chapter 22 Chapter 23, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 23, we find the story of the crucifixion. Now, let's make one thing clear this morning. No one in history has ever been sinned against more than Jesus. No one. There's not a person in history that has ever been sinned against more than Jesus. We all know that he came in flesh and he came and dwelt among us so that we could have that example, that perfect example. But we find here in Luke chapter 23 exactly what I want to talk about this morning. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's already been beaten. He's already been mocked. They're making fun of him. His friends, his so-called friends, the leaders, all these people, we find him hanging on the cross in verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and they mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. The other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man... Has done nothing wrong. Verse 42, then Jesus, remember me. He said to Jesus, remember me when you go into your kingdom. Verse 43, Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. We find here that even Jesus hanging on the cross, even hanging on the cross, he still chose forgiveness. If ever there was a time that he could choose bitterness, everyone would understand it would have been then. If ever there was a time where Jesus would have said, that's it, I'm calling fire down from heaven, fixing to zap every one of you turkeys right now. You want me to be God? You doubt me? All right, I'm going to show you right now. If ever there was a time 
that he could have chosen bitterness, it was then. But even on the cross, even at the darkest moment, Jesus still chose to forgive. I don't know about you, but when I read that, and I put that into perspective, and then I bring that over into my own life, and I bring over all the hurt and all the pain and the things that, that I have been so justified in all these years, that I, have, that I have held over people, and I have, when I start to look at the things that have been done to me, and I compare it to what Jesus did, I feel a little ashamed. I don't know about you. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. When I mentioned bitterness and I mentioned forgiveness, unforgiveness to you a few moments ago, many of you had kind of an image of someone. You had someone immediately come to mind and on your heart. You, you had someone, there's no doubt that there's many of us in this room today that have relationships that have not been reconciled. We have things left unsaid and there are people in our life that even when they call or we see them in Walmart or we duck and try to move out of the way. We don't even want to face them because there's some unsettled things in there. Can we all just be honest this morning and just say we've all dealt with bitterness? That maybe we're all continually dealing with the process of forgiveness and bitterness. If you, you've got in your hand something, does it, did everybody get one? We're going to be going over that in just a few seconds. And it's, it's seven things that forgiveness is. Seven things that forgiveness is not. And I want you to take this with you. I want you to put it in your Bible. I want you to make notes. I want you to keep this with you. My goal here today is not to point fingers. My goal here today is to get you to realize that God wants you to forgive so that you can be everything that God wants you to be. The reason why Jesus had to forgive is because at that moment on the cross, had he had chosen bitterness, everything he had done to that point would have been nullified. Everything to that point would have been for nothing. You and I have the opportunity and we have the choice in our life to either choose forgiveness or choose bitterness. I don't know about you today, but I want to choose forgiveness. And we're going to walk through the process of that on how tough that is. Amen? Look in Ephesians chapter 4. We find here the Scripture gives us really some insight on how we need to deal with this as Christians, as believers. All right, how we need to process this. Because the reality is we've all been hurt. We've all had things done against us. We've all really have something in our life that really we could, we're justified in maybe being angry or holding a grudge or something like that. But look in Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 21. Paul here says, Surely you heard of him and you were taught in him, Jesus, talking about Jesus, according to with the, with the truth that is in Jesus. Verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, how many would agree this morning that you've had a hard time and there's been seasons in your life where it was really hard to put off the old man? and the old ways, and the old thoughts, and that, that process of accepting Christ and accepting forgiveness and moving forward, how many would agree that it's, you've had times in your life where it wasn't easy just to take off that old attitude and that old desire and walk in that new freedom? And that, but this is what Jesus is saying here. This is what he's teaching us here, that we have to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in love and righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthful to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. I want you to notice something in these scriptures that we're reading. The responsibility is on me. The responsibility is on you. It doesn't say, go to the church, have pastor pray over you, and then you will go into a trance, and then you will be able, everything will be fine, and everything will just fall off of you, and you just need to read six verses, click your heels three times, turn around, and then you will just be, you'll just be, everything's going to be great. It doesn't work that way. Scripture is very clear that when you and I are moving forward, 
We have to be the ones to put off. We have to be the ones to turn the TV off. We have to be the ones to say, I can't look at the computer anymore. I'm canceling my my internet connection. I'm canceling my cable. I don't need that trash because I continually look at it. Oh, man, it got quiet. Let me go over here. There are things that we have to do that we have to put off the OA. We have to be the ones to do that. Too many of us are waiting on somebody else to do it for us. Well, if we just had this and if we just do that, and no, 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 no. You've got to be the one to take this and make up your mind, I'm not doing this anymore. You've got to put that off. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. Speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we're all members of one body. Verse 26, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Those are two scriptures right there that you need to underline and that you need to mark in your Bible. Because that's a very key verse right there. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. But the more important thing is, why? So you don't allow Satan to have a foothold. You don't allow him an opportunity to plant a seed of bitterness, negativity, of hurt, of pain. Because when you avoid it, because when you pretend it didn't happen, it gives the devil an opportunity to slip in there and cause some dissension. Do not, listen, in your anger, do not sin. Getting angry is not a sin. Getting mad is not a sin. Pick your Bible up and read it. God gets angry a lot. God got angry many, many times and wiped out whole cities. And Anger is not a sin. It's when you allow your anger to lead into sin. You can get upset, and you're going to get upset. I've been upset many times with other people, and I get upset with God. Anybody ever been upset with God? You can shake your head. It's all right. He's not going to strike you down today. He may, but I hope he doesn't, all right? You've been upset. The anger Jesus is saying in the Scripture saying, listen, it's okay to be angry. Be angry and sin not. It's what your anger, if you allow it to get a hold of you and turn to bitterness, that it turns into sin. But do not let things go on. Verse 28, he who has been stealing, let him steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his hands, that he may have something to share with those. Verse 29, do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Once again, that's something you and I have to do, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. How many of you agree that when you're bitter and you're upset and you're, it's hard to be uplifting? When you've allowed bitterness and pain to get a hold of you, it's hard for you to speak any kind of positive things. It's tough. And you definitely are not, you're definitely not in a place where you're able to build other people up. How many of you have been around some bitter people and you just immediately, you know it, and they start talking like, whoa, there's some things going on here. We've got to get to the point, and let, don't let that unwholesome talk, verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You see that last verse there, verse 32, be compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ forgave you. We read that just a second ago, that there was a time that Jesus could have chosen bitterness. It could have been on the cross. But even in all that, he is strengthening us and encouraging us. Listen, you've got to be the one to put off these things. You've got to be the one not to let it come out of your mouth. But more importantly, you've got to be the one in love. You've got to forgive. You and I have to forgive because that's what Jesus did for us. Amen? Now, there's several things that are very obvious about bitter people. Let's, let's just be honest this morning. Number one, bitter people usually have a very, very good reason. Bitter people usually have a very good reason. There's some of you here this morning, you're in a form of bitterness, and you know what? If you were to tell me or the church what it was, we would all agree that's a very good reason to be bitter. What has been done to you, what has been said to you, what you've had to experience, bitter people usually have a good reason. 
It's not that you don't have a reason to be bitter. It's just you've got to choose not to be bitter. Bitter people usually have a reason to be bitter. There have been stages in my life where I have been a very, very, very bitter, angry, not so pleasant to be around person. Why? Because something was done to me and said to me, and let's just be honest, it hurt. It hurt. See, it's easy for me, and it's really hard for some people because my personality is I'm pretty, I'm pretty outgoing and I'm pretty confident. Not a lot of things, not a lot of things bother me, right, Cameron? There's not a lot of things that really get to me. And because of my personality, I'm able to just let a lot of things throw. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that that I can take people because I grew up being teased my whole life. My dad teases me. I just grew up in a house where, if you know, listen, you're just going to have to take it. If you don't, and if you cry and you whine about it, it just turns up the heat a little bit, all right? You know, if you start whining, and, oh, what? well, if I knew you was going to cry about it, I wouldn't have said anything about it. Then it just turns into that more. And so once you start bawling about it, then that's a weakness. And so then they attack that weakness. My dad would just, just pound it and pound it. And just, so I grew up being teased a lot. I grew up just things happening, being around people. And, and so my personality is really just, there's a lot of things that really don't get to me. But you know what? I'm just like everybody else. I don't like it when people are hateful or mean. I don't like it. I may laugh it off. I may, listen, I can't tell you how many times I cried growing up because I I wasn't husky. I was a little fat kid, all right? I I cried many, many times because I would get made fun of or people would say something about my weight. And so I would cry. That would hurt. You know, and those are things that, People don't see. Those are things you don't. But you know what? Those things hurt. And you know what? I can remember some of those kids. I've looked them up on Facebook. They're bigger than I am now. I love it. Can't wait. I'm going to lose another 20 pounds, and then I'm going to get on there and call them fat boy, all right? Those things have a way of getting to you. And if we're not careful those hurtful things that are said or done to you. Some of you today, you're you're dealing with stuff that was done to you by family members, things that were done to you as a kid, things that were done to you by your first marriage, things you walked through hurt and pain that you've had to experience. You've walked through a lot of things. And I mentioned just a second ago, a lot bitter people usually have a good reason. People struggling in bitterness or depression usually have a good reason. See, a lot of times, women usually, if they're struggling with bitterness, and it usually comes out in a form of depression. Men, when they're struggling with depression, it comes out in anger. It comes out in just escalated times. You can be talking with someone and just, rah, it just comes out of nowhere. It's usually someone, you see a man that's, that's it's usually not, it's usually not they're angry. There's usually depression that's caught, brought on by bitterness. And that's the way we're dealing with it. See, most bitter people have a very good reason to be bitter. Sometimes people get bitter and do things against you. And they, they bring things against you simply because of envy, self-ambition. James calls it that in James chapter. James chapter 3 verse 14. It says, do not let. Do not harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition. Sometimes people, sometimes people get mad and they get angry towards you just because you got a new job, because you got a new house, or your marriage is doing good. Sometimes people get upset and they get bitter because someone's getting married and they're not married. Sometimes people get upset and they get bitter because you're skinnier than them. Just It can be anything. Sometimes you don't do anything for Sometimes people get bitter and angry just out of bitter envy and selfish ambition. Those things just happen. You're not even, you didn't even do anything to that person. You're just living your life. And you make the mistake of sharing something great that happened to you. Guys, listen, you'd love to be able to share your promotion with everybody, but not everybody wants to hear about your promotion. You can share your promotion and say, listen, man, and it can be one of your closest friends. 
You share about your promotion and, hey, God, I, listen, you wouldn't believe what happened. I got a promotion. I'm making $20,000 more a year. And immediately envy sets in. And from that moment on, they don't look at you the same. From that moment on, they determine in their heart, well, they think they're better than us now. Well, I guess we can't hang out with them now because they make more money and he's got a better job because he's told me three times when all you were doing was sharing with a friend. Sometimes things happen and people get bitter towards you and angry towards you and you didn't do anything about it. It's just selfish ambition. It's, it's that bitter envy. It's just that sinful nature. Everybody say sinful nature that we, we just read about it, that we have to put off the old man. We have to fight and crucify the flesh. Crucify that desire to do what we want to do and to satisfy what Justin wants. It's that fighting. Sometimes people are bitter and they're hateful and they're mean to you and you don't even know why. And you can't think for the life of you of anything that you've said are done to them, and they can't stand you. They've deleted you from Facebook. They won't look at you. They won't talk to you. They avoid you like the plague. You see them, and you come. I don't know how many times that I've had people that you come in contact with, and really, like at Walmart, you come around the aisle, and you're buggy to buggy, and there's nothing they can do about it, and it's like they saw a ghost. And you don't even know what, why it's so awkward and what's going on. But something has happened in their heart. Something has gotten a hold of them. That root of envy and bitterness. The word says in Hebrew that we have to dig up the root of bitterness. We have to dig that up so that it doesn't keep coming back. It's enough of you in here this morning. You understand it's not enough just to prune it back. You've got to get to the roots. It's not. A, has any of you ever taken like a little sticker patch and weeded it over and it just, that's the worst thing you can do. But you've got to pull things up by the root. You've got to get to the root of it so that it doesn't keep growing back. And listen, there's some of us, we've allowed bitterness in our heart and we have bitterness towards other people. And if we sit back and really think about it, what really, what really did they do? Or did we allow the enemy a chance to get a foothold on our life. It's something so silly and one little comment, one little remark or one little incident, we chose to be bitter instead of to forgive. Remember, every relationship has it. Every situation, there is a chance to forgive and there's a chance to be bitter. And if you don't choose forgiveness, you're automatically choosing bitterness because you're allowing a seed to be planted The Word says you're giving the enemy a chance of foothold in your life. If you look up foothold, if you look up that word and what it means, it it refers to like a castle moving in to a room, occupying. It's, It's allowing the enemy to occupy a place in your heart. It's giving him an opportunity to move in to where you live. It's basically saying, hey, Satan, I've got an extra bedroom. Why don't you just come live with us? It's not going to affect one thing. We're busy. We're doing our own thing. We're spiritual enough. We've got, you know what? It's okay. I'm just, I'm just going to hang on to this one. For, it's basically what you're doing is he's moving into the house. You know what happens when people move into the house. I mean, y'all have roommates. Listen, things change. My brother-in-law, who I love with all my heart, this past spring break, my sister and brother-in-law came down. They'd been in our house for about eight hours. He jumped on the four-wheeler. He jumped, he fell off, he broke his collarbone, he passed out, he came to, he passed out, we took him to the hospital, he come back, he sat in my living room for a week, in my recliner, Trace, in front of my TV, right in the middle, because he couldn't move, he's in a lot of pain, squealing, holler, all this other stuff, I hope he hears this, because it was the funniest thing, we got in the truck, Jack, and we were going down the road, and my gravel, we live on a dirt road, gravel road, and so he's like, just, just get to the hospital, I'm like, all right, I take him, ha, 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 stop, 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 like, okay, no, 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 go, go ahead and go faster, and I'd, I'd speed, no, 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 stop, 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 I'm like, listen, you're going to have to tell me what you want me to do, because we're not going to get there, we're, we're five miles on the dirt road, so it's going to be an hour, so you're going to have to let me drive, you're going to have to suck it up or something, you're going to have to do, so, but he stayed, in the first couple of days, it was cool. First couple of days, I felt sorry for him. After day four, listen, Jack, 
I need my remote back. And I may move you to the other bedroom and set up another system here, but you're going to have to. I love you, but you, I don't like you living smack dab in the middle of my house. And this is family. This, that's what happens when we don't deal with things and we just pretend it never happened. We're giving the devil a place in our room, in our house. We're inviting him in, and we're not just inviting him in for a visit. We're saying, hey, just stay. Just hang out. It'd be cool. It's fine. We're not even here much. You see, a lot of times bitter people have a good reason. And then sometimes people get bitter towards us, and even when we get bitter towards other people, and it's just out of selfish ambition, it's out of envy. It's, out of, it's just out of selfish reasons, and they didn't really do anything to us, but we allowed the enemy to get a foothold, and that just began to grow. And then sometimes people are that way towards us, and that's basically where they're at. And you and I have to make a decision. We can either turn our bitterness towards them and say, you know what? They don't like me. I don't like them. They don't want to talk to me. I don't want to talk to them. I guess they weren't my... If we want to retaliate, then guess what? We're choosing bitterness. We're choosing bitterness, and that just leads to us being just like them. My dad, my whole life, it's one of the saints. How many of your parents had little sayings that just drove you nuts? They'd say it over and over and over, and you're like, I wish you'd just stop saying that. My dad, and anything, anytime something would happen or someone, I watched my dad get cussed out and treat my dad bad and all this stuff. My dad would just cry and tell people that he loved them and work with them, never would retaliate, and I'd get so mad. I'm like, Dad, what are you doing? You can't. Why would you let them do that? Why would you let them? They don't need, you need to, you need to kick them out. You need to do it, you know. I said, listen, son, I don't, I'll leave that up to God. He said, if I do that, then I'll be just like them. And I don't want to be like them. I don't want to do that. He said, once you retaliate, you can't gripe about that person anymore because then you're just like them. If someone's talking about you and treating you bad, the moment you start treating them bad, then you need to keep your mouth shut because you're just like them. That's not what God calls us to do. We have the choice either to forgive or bitterness. Look at that piece of paper that you have this morning. These are seven things that forgiveness is and seven things that forgiveness is not. Some of these that we get confused, and I, I think this is, I wanted you to have this so you can take with you because there's some things that, we get confused on a lot of times that we think because to forgive somebody that we have to do a certain thing, and that's not the case. Seven things that forgiveness is. Number one, forgiveness is canceling of debt. We, we sung about it this morning. Because of the cross, our debt is paid. Forgiveness, you and I, Jesus has already given forgiveness. When you forgive, it's over. It's a canceling of debt. You're, when you forgive someone, it's not yours to carry. God has already released them. God has taken care of that. It's a canceling of debt. Number two, it's removing that person's control over you. It's huge. It's huge. When you truly forgive, when you truly say, I forgive that person. I, I'm done. I, I'm, not carrying, I'm not carrying it. It removes that person's control over you. It, it takes that authority off. And when you truly forgive, it removes that. Number three, it's a gift for them and you. Forgiveness is a gift that's both for you and for them. Number four, forgiveness is forsaking revenge. When you and I forgive, what we're doing is we're forfeiting the right to get revenge. It's you saying, it's over for me. I'm not going to carry it. I'm not going to look for my opportunity six months down the road. Forgiveness is you forfeiting the right to revenge, to get revenge. Because there's some of us in here today you have dreamed about and you have planned how you're going to get your revenge. It's haunted you. It controls you. It controls every relationship that you have. It, it dictates who you are, how you love, all of that. Because you're trying to, you're hanging on to that. You need to forgive. Number five, forgiveness is leaving ultimate justice to God. When you forgive, you're saying, you know what, God? 
It's in your hands now. If you want to punish them, if you want them, God, you are the judge. You're a righteous God. When you forgive, you're saying, you know what? It's in God's hands. It's not mine to carry anymore. You forgive them. Now let God deal with it. That's what forgiveness is. Number six, it's both a decision and a process. Listen, I, I've chosen to forgive people in my life, and you know, and you forgive them, but th- there's a process to that. You forgive them, and then a week later, you find something else out that was said or done, and then you're like, ah, oh. okay, and then you, you deal with that, and then, and then down the road, something... It's a decision to forgive, but it's also a process. You have to process it when more things start coming. There's, it's not just a simple kneel down, I forgive them, and move on, because if you're still having contact with them, you're still, there's a process of, all right, this has happened, this has happened, now I've got to deal with this. I've decided to forgive them, but, okay, I just found out some more stuff, so I'm going to have to process this for a second but I still choose to forgive them. And number seven, this one's huge. Forgiveness is genuinely, genuinely wanting good for them. Forgiveness is when you know you've really reached that point where you've forgiven that person is where you truly want good things for them. It's not that place where you hear they're in an accident or something happened and you kind of get a little grin on your face or you hear that their wife left them and you're like, oh, yeah, well. You're like, oh, it's about time something. No, 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 no. If that's the feeling that comes over you, then, then you haven't truly forgiven them. Forgiveness is when you can get to the point and you really, truly, honestly want good things for them. Where you truly, I want them to be blessed. I hope that God blesses them. Now, This is where it gets tricky. Seven things that forgiveness is not. We'll go through these pretty quick. Forgiveness is not denying or diminishing the sin. Just because you forgive somebody doesn't mean that you've denied what they've done to you or that you are minimizing what has been done. It's still sin, but you still have to forgive. Forgiveness is not enabling. Sometimes we we don't want to forgive people because they're still in their sin. They're still hurting people. They're still in addiction. They're still doing to others what they've done to you. And you think, well, if I forgive them, then that tells them it's okay to continue to act that way. No, no, no. That's not a reason for you to hang on to your unforgiveness. You forgiving them does not enable them. Is everybody with me this morning? You forgiving them is not enabling them. You still need to forgive them. Sometimes we don't give forgiveness for that reason. Because we see them doing the same thing to other people and we think, I'm not forgiving them. They haven't learned their lesson. They're not even sorry. You're right, they may not be. We're not talking about, this is about you. You and I have to make the decision to forgive. So forgiveness is not enabling. Number three, forgiveness is not a response to an apology. Number four, Forgiveness is not covering a sin. Sometimes people will come to us, and I've had this a lot happen to me and just because of my interaction with people, but people will come to me and say, Pastor, I'm, I'm guilty of doing this. This is what I'm involved in. This is what I've done. Nobody knows, but I'm telling you. And so I can choose to forgive them from what they've done and what they've said and what they've been involved in, but that doesn't take away the fact that we're covering it up. If it's a sin and if it's breaking the law, then they still need to come clean for it. If someone comes to me and say, Pastor, listen, I- I've been stealing from my company and I've been stealing all this other stuff. Well, that's fine. Let's process that. I forgive you, but you still need to, you're still held accountable for your sin. Forgiveness is not just saying, oh, it's all right. It'll just be our little secret. No, no, no. Forgiveness is not covering up sin. Number five, this is big. Forgiveness is not forgetting. We hear it all the time. Forgive and forget. I got news for you. You and I can't do that. I 
wish I could. And I know you do too. I wish you could forget some things that have been done and said to you. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to forgive and just forget like it never ever happened? Some of you are trying to live that way and it's not possible. You cannot forget it. Only God can forget it. You have to forgive, but you also, you're going to remember. But there's some things you need to remember so that you don't put your family and you don't put other people in harm's way of that. If somebody has done and said things and they've got a, a, a behavior pattern that is detrimental to you and other people, you need to remember that. People that grew up in an abusive relationship and uh, maybe an abusive family member, you don't want to put your kids and your family around that same person. You may forgive them, but you don't forget. You don't just say, well, I forgive and forget, and so like it never happened. That's not the way it works. Forgiving is not forgetting. Number six, trust. Forgiveness is not automatic trust. Trust is something that is lost quickly, but it's gained slowly. And it goes right into number seven, reconciliation. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. It's not everything is just going to be fine. Your future may not look like your past. I have relationships that good friends of mine, people that I love and respect and I still respect today, but because of one thing or another, I was hurt. Because of that hurt, because of those things that happened, I had to forgive them, but that didn't mean that our relationship went back to the way it was. It's no different than when, it's no different than in your relationship, growing up and dating someone, <laughs> You know, you, you break up and you say things you don't not supposed to say and you do all this stuff and then there's that point. Let's just go back to the way it used to be. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's just start all over and let's just pretend this never happened. How many know that never works out? Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Forgiveness, forgiving somebody doesn't mean that you have to be their best friend again. Forgiving them doesn't mean that you have to put yourself in the same situation again like you did before. Your future may not look like your past. And that's okay. It doesn't have to for there to truly be forgiveness. These are things that in our mind we think, well, if I forgave the person, then everything has to be like it should. We, I still have to act and we got to go to the same places and we got to be, we got to do the same events and like we did before because that's really, that's really a true judge of did I forgive them or not. No, that's not. That's not at all what it is. You forgiving them doesn't mean that you just act like nothing ever happened and you just go on. You forgiving them, you forgive them so that you can move on in your relationship with Christ. And forgiveness, we, we talked about what it is. It's getting to the point where you truly want good things for them. Where you truly want them to be blessed. You truly want them to experience that same freedom you have. But in every single relationship this morning, you and I have to choose forgiveness no matter what. We have to be the one, if we don't want to be bitter, if we don't want to live our life miserable, we got to be the one to choose forgiveness. I'm going to close with this. I'd never heard this story. Never even heard this preached. And in preparing for this message, and this is a series that was preached by Stephen Furtick. And Mark Driscoll, when he was preaching this, told this story about Jesus hanging on the cross. And I'd never even heard this scripturally. There was a, all of us have heard of when Jesus was hanging on the cross and the Roman soldiers took a stick, sponge, and they dipped in vinegar and they shoved it in his mouth. I mean, remember that story. You know that story. He's hanging on there. They're mocking him and ridiculing him. And they do this. They take this sponge. It's on the end of a long rod and they shove it in his face. There was a, it's customary back then, during that time that, they would have, when they would go to the restroom, kings and different officials and stuff, they had 
They're very sophisticated. You know, they had actual toilets and different things that they would sit on. But they didn't have Charmin and all that. They didn't have toilet paper and all that stuff back then. And so the way they would do that, the more sophisticated people, they had a toilet built and they had a little area there just, you know, a place where they would take a sponge and that's what they would use as toilet paper. And they would do that. In order to keep it sanitary, they would dip it in vinegar. It was on a long stick and different things. And that's what they used as toilet paper. And so when you start to think about all the things that have been done to you and all the things that have been said to you and how you felt like you've been done wrong, and all this stuff that we have that we feel justified in being bitter and angry and mad at people. Jesus hanging on the cross, combined with all the insults, with all the being beaten, every single thing that was taking place, even taking a stick with a sponge that was used, basically used as toilet paper. That's what they take to stick in his face. That's what they used to put in his face. At that moment, he still chose to forgive. I, under, I understand. I get it. I understand the feeling to want to get revenge, to want to make someone pay, to want everybody to know. But Jesus in verse 32 told us, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You've got to forgive. No matter what's happened to you, no matter what's been said and what's been done, no matter if you're sitting here today and you have bitterness towards somebody else and you've allowed that selfish ambition and you've allowed that greed and that sinful, sinful nature to creep in, take hold of you you need to forgive today. It cancels the debt. It removes that person from control over your life. It would be the best thing you ever did today, I promise you. When you get to the point where you can truly pray for people, <laughs> pray for them and believe God for them and not pray at them. And let me tell you, many of you can testify this morning, it's a decision and it's a process. There's been people that I've had to forgive, but it, didn't, it took longer than a day. <laughs> it took longer than two weeks. For some people, it took months for me to truly get to the point where I truly forgave them. That when I thought about them and I saw them and I heard that I truly thought good things for them and not, it's about time. Some of you are there today. Some of you are in that process. You're right in the middle of it, trying to forgive, but you keep finding things out. You just you got to choose to forgive, because if you don't, if you don't choose forgiveness, then you're automatically choosing bitterness. God can't use you if you're bitter. At his weakest moment, at the time he's most justified, Jesus could have said. That's it, I'm done, I can't take any more. But he didn't. He chose to forgive, even hanging on the cross, beaten, that stinking sponge shoved in his face. One more last insult to just humiliate him. Just say, oh yeah, we'll give him something to drink. We'll, here, let's get one of these and let's shove that in his face. All of them laughing and giggling and mocking. Yet he chose to forgive in that moment. That's what he's wanting us to do this morning. Bow your heads with me, would you? Thank you, Jesus. Many of you made the commitment to me just a few seconds ago that you would open your heart and you allow the Holy Spirit to deal with some things this morning. That's all I'm asking for you to do. I realize this morning that there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of things that are running through your mind right now. But you and I, this morning, we have a decision to make. We either choose forgiveness or we choose bitterness. And you know this morning, it's God's will for you to truly choose forgiveness, to start that process. Some of you are in the middle of it. Some of you haven't even begun to think about it. You've been so 
hardened and so closed off to it, you don't want anything to, you don't even want to think about it. Even this morning, you've already tuned me out 20 minutes ago. Said, you know what, Pastor, you don't even know what you're talking about. You have no clue what's been said or done to me. You have no right to stand up there and tell me that I need to forgive. If you knew my story, there's no way you would ask me to forgive. God's telling you, you have to forgive. His word is very clear. Unless you forgive, you cannot be forgiven. I could share with you story after story personally this morning that if I had not chosen to forgive people, I wouldn't be in the ministry today. I wouldn't have the marriage I have today. I wouldn't have the friendships I have today. You have to choose to forgive. Because if not, bitterness will take over and it will control every decision you make. It will make you miserable. It will haunt you. It will destroy your family. It will destroy your finances, your business. It will destroy your witness. Some of you today, you need to choose forgiveness. You need to start that process. Some of you are right in the middle of it. Some of you are pretty close to the point where you can truly hear their name or you can see them in public and you don't want to run and hide or throw up getting better but it's a process I want to ask you this morning I just want everybody to stand with me if you would I'm not wanting to single anybody out what I'm wanting to do this morning this is something that has to be done with you personally it's not something that I need you to raise your hand or come to the front I don't need you to do that I don't need to know about it but what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to open these altars and I believe that everybody needs to move somewhere so one thing that I do know this morning, we have all are dealing with this situation. You may be in the beginning stages of it. You may be past it, whatever it is. But if you, you're in this process, because it's a continual thing for you and I when we deal with people and we invest, people are going to hurt us. People are going to say things. And you know what? We even get caught up in hurting other people. My hand is up. I've been caught up in saying and doing things that I shouldn't have done because my heart wasn't right, because I wasn't doing, I wasn't listening to the right people. I wasn't on my knees listening to God. I was listening to other people. Because I was listening to other people, I got involved in things that were not wholesome talk. I wasn't putting off the old man. You know what I was doing? I was operating in the old man. Listen, I, I don't, I don't cuss because I forgot the words. It's not that I need someone when I hit my finger with a hammer that I just go, somebody give me a cuss word, anybody. I, I can't remember one. Somebody hurry, Corky help me, give me three or four. Not that you would know any of those. It's not, it's that moment where you choose not to do that. You got to put off the old ways and that old desire and that that desire to just want to get revenge and retaliate and let them they need to suffer like I'm suffering. They need to feel the pain. I've been there and I've fallen to that temptation and I've been the one that has hurt people. But I've also been on the other side of that where I had to forgive them and I had to be the one to go to them, look them in the eye and tell them. I need to ask you to forgive me for what I've said and I've done to you. I'm sorry. That was a moment everything released and broke off my life. Because it's, it's honestly, that, that needs to be number one instead of number two. It removes that person's control over you. It releases you from that. When you truly forgive and you ask for forgiveness, All of us are in one stage or the other. But what I do know without a shadow of a doubt is that the enemy is doing everything that he can to get a foothold on your life. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your ministry. He wants to destroy your walk with God. He wants to put doubt in your mind. He wants a foothold. And he'll use the words that come out of your mouth. He'll use the words that come out of somebody else's mouth. He'll use a little smirk, a little look. Did you see the way she looked at me? 
that walked right by me. Of course, what you didn't know is that they just found out that someone in their family just died and just and they were a little preoccupied, which is why they walked by you. But that doesn't matter because they were rude to you and now bitterness has set in and it starts the process of hating that person. We got to guard that. So, Pastor, that doesn't even make sense. No, you know why? Because that's the way the enemy does it. He deceives. He's a liar. He can't even, scripture says he can't even tell the truth. He will lie to you and deceive you and make you think someone did something and they didn't. That bitterness will kick in. And then you just stall out with your ability to be able to move with God. I don't want that to happen to any person in this room today. I want you to truly experience what forgiveness is. Some of you today, I'm going to pray and I'm going to open these altars and I want you to come. And it needs to be your prayer today. You need to get some things right. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you this morning, God. Holy Spirit, right now, begin to move in each and every heart. Bring to mind that person, what we've said, what we've done, what's been done against us. God, let us today release it. Let us open up deepest, darkest parts of our heart and let us allow you in so you can take it. Help us today, God, to truly surrender our life to you so that we can choose forgiveness and not bitterness. Let it be done in every life today. Amen. I'm going to open these altars. Will you come? Come on. Jeff is just going to begin to play. I want every person to move somewhere. I want you to move from your seat, down three seats, move up to the next row, find a place in this service this morning. Find a place in this sanctuary. Some of you need to start that process. Some of you need to continue that process. But this morning, find a place. Get along with God just for a few moments. Some of you may need to spend a lot more than that. Will you find a place this morning? Come on. There's not a person in this room that's exempt from it. Every person needs to find a place. Let's ask God to help us this morning. Amen.